What you're looking at here on the whiteboard is just the overview of the formulae that we derived last week. We spent a long time deriving the uh, flat plate uh, clutch theories in constant pressure and constant wear theories. And basically what you're looking at there are the formulae that, that the derivations produced. Don't forget with uh, clutch theory, we've got the, uh, this is all for flat plates at the moment we're looking at, uh, we've got two types of theory. We've got the constant pressure theory, where the pressure is assumed constant across the entire clutch surface, and that's really for for new clutches. Uh, and then we've got the what's called the constant wear theory. That's where the pressure varies across the surface, but the wear is assumed constant. The pressure times radius is is sort of defined as the wear, if you like, um, across the surface. So two types of theory, and the questions usually state which theory to use. Often they state use both. Um, if in any doubt with the questions, use constant wear if it doesn't say. But in most cases, it, it's quite clear as to what theory to use. Don't forget that W is the actual force that's pushing the clutch plates together. Okay, and T is the torque that's generated by uh, the um, uh, clutch arrangement we've got. And this little N uh, symbol here, and the um, back of the second formula shown here, um, that means the number of clutch plates, number of friction pairs we have. Okay, so if we have one clutch plate, and obviously that's one. If we have four, then that's four. Um, so just read the questions carefully as to how many um, clutch plates there are in a particular configuration only occurs in the torque formula the little n at the back of the formula there just for your reference the formula i'm looking at there are all listed on your formula sheet i handed out recently you've got a formula sheet of all the formulae for this whole unit and on page 19 of that you will see all the formulae we're going to use today all right so just as a quick reference guide that that sheet is quite useful so that's on your formula sheet a separate handout from your notes um, where, um, where all the formula are just stated there in one long listing on that page and we'll pick them up as we need to go through the session. And so today's just going to be lots of questions. I'm not going to go through the theory again, outline anything. You've got that on the video now. You can just go and pick up the video if you want to see how it was derived. That, that's required. Um, I'm just going to go through lots of questions today. Last week we looked at example one and example two, and they were in the previous video. Um, today we're going to continue with questions. All right. Just some more angular motion formulae here that we might use, uh, or we'll use some of them actually. The power uh, output formula, P is equal to T omega, we'll be using that in, in most of the questions. Um, Newton's second law is going to be applied in one of the questions, T is equal to I alpha. Um, again, this is because of our background, we haven't covered all of the uh, prerequisite theory here. This T is equal to I alpha is actually Newton's second law applied to angular motion. I don't know if you remember now, a long time ago, but in linear motion, we called that F is equal to MA, where the uh, force required to accelerate an object was dependent on the, the mass. The mass is sort of the inertia effect. The MA is the inertia effect. So the bigger the mass, the bigger the force required to get the acceleration. And in the angular sense, the angular motion sense, we're rotating, um, like in the clutch configurations, the force becomes a torque and the mass becomes what's called the moment of inertia. It's like the resistance to motion of the section. And the A for linear acceleration, that becomes alpha for angular acceleration. So it's very analogous formula. We did mention briefly uh, this in our first lecture, I think, um, a few weeks ago now, about the an, uh, analogy between linear motion and angular motion. So that will crop up in one instance, I know, later on. And also the formula for angular acceleration shown below here, this formula here, will also crop up. Um, and again, that's really the uh, same as the linear motion equations. We're used probably to seeing A is equal to V minus U divided by T. That's the linear motion equations. V is the final velocity, U is the initial, and T is the time. That gives us the acceleration in a linear sense. And this is the angular sense, the uh, final angular velocity omega f minus the initial angular velocity omega i divided by time gives the angular acceleration. So we might meet those later on in, in one question, but we'll, we'll pick that when we do. All right? Mainly it's, the, it's these equations we're going to be used predominantly in the analysis today. Okay, so I'm going to go straight to the questions. I'm going to try and work some reasonably quickly. So question 1P in your notes. Let's go through this and extract the information and see if we can solve this. All to do with flat plate clutches at the moment. So it's asked to transmit 12 kilowatts, that's our power, at 1500 revs per minute. Don't forget we have to convert revs per minute into radians per second when we do our calculations, but we often 
um, speak in terms of rest per minute when we're defining the question. So that's power and that's the speed. Um, and from that, we'll be able to find a torque because that's the um, P is equal to T omega formula here. I can see I can get a torque from that if I need it in a moment. Let's read on. We're given the inner and outer radii. Are 50 millimeters and 100 millimeters respectively. We'll turn, turn them into meters in a moment. And we're given the maximum spring force, and that's the axial force, symbol W, um, is limited to uh, one kilonewton. We're also given the coefficient of friction, which is 0.35. We've got to define, uh, determine the necessary number of pairs of friction surfaces that would be required if we assume uniform wear theory. It also says find what is the necessary axial force. And that's something we'll do at the end. What they're essentially saying here is find, given the information, find the number of friction pairs. Uh, we'll probably round them up. It might come out to be, I don't know what it's going to come out to be, um, 2.9 or something. We'll round it up to 3. And then we'll go back and find the actual axial force we need. It's a bit like the examples we did last week. Uh, the actual axial force will be slightly lower. Um, because we'll have slightly more friction pairs than we need, effectively. I've also put the geometry on the, on the right-hand side here, so we can just write down the, the inner and outer radii. We need those in all the formulae we're looking at on the friction clutches. So I've just put the notation here. So little d is the inside diameter, big d is outside diameter, and then we can work out our outside radius is the big d divided by 2, and the inside radius is little d divided by 2. So I can just go straight for writing down them. The radii. Okay, let's start in taking the information from the question. I'm going to start writing the information down nice and clearly. So we're given the um, power effectively. So power, symbol P, and that's 12 kilowatts. I'm going to take the kilo away from uh, the number. I'm going to remove the prefix, in other words. So 12,000 watts we have there. And the speed, the angular velocity, is 1500 RPM. So angular velocity. I use the symbol omega and I'm going to put that straight into radians per second. So, so 1500 revs per minute and the conversion to radians per second, hopefully we'll get familiar with this, it's 2 pi divided by 60. But, um, on my calculator I've got a value of 157 radians per second. Yours might give it in terms of pi radians which is preferable really. Um, so 157 radians per second. If you've got in terms of pi radians, uh, then feel free to use that. Um, that's the more accurate value. My calculator doesn't do that, so I'm going to leave it as 157 radians per second. That's a little bit rounded up, possibly, there. Um, what else have we got in the question? We've got the inner and outer radii, so I can write them uh, down. So um, uh, our O for outside radius is given to us. That's I'm going to put it straight in meters, so 0 0.1 meters. Notice they've given us the radius here. They don't always give you the radii. They normally give you the diameter. So just be careful sometimes um, of what information is given. And the inner radius, I'll go straight to meters. So that's 0 0.05 meters. So again, just be careful there with the units. Always use meters in dynamics. But the actual force we're given, let's write that down. So the actual force. And that's symbol W, if you look at last week's work, and that's one kilonewton. Again, I'm going to remove the prefix. Let's go straight for 1,000 newtons, or 10 to the 3 newtons. And the coefficient of friction is given. So we've got to find the number of pairs. So we've got to find little n in this case, the number of pairs of friction surfaces. Okay, now if I just flip back to the formula, the first thing I'm going to do here is use this P is equal to T omega formula because they've given us the power in this particular question. They've, they've given us implicitly the angular velocity in radians per second. So I can rearrange that to find the torque. So that's my first protocol. Whenever I'm given power, I usually look for the P is equal to T omega formula. Uh, and then they want to find the number of friction surfaces. And that's for a constant wear clutch, a uniform wear clutch. So we've got the W will be given to us in the question. We've got that got the torque given to us in the question of that I can rearrange the equation to find m ever since I've got so that's my sort of thinking step through first of all find the torque from the power and then find the number of friction pairs from the torque formula okay so step one we're going to find the torque so from the torque equation for the constant wear situation we need to transpose the equation for t 
So multiplying both sides by 2 and dividing throughout by the mu w and the bracket shown here on the top line, we find the equation for the number of pairs of friction surfaces, little n, is equal to 2t divided by mu w multiplied by the bracket of r0 plus ri. Now in the question, we're implicitly given what the torque is. We can find that from the power. So the question states the power, p, that is transmitted for the speed, omega, which we converted into radians per second. Shown here at the beginning of our calculations. So in this case, the torque is 12,000 divided by the 157 radians per second. We find the torque is 76.4 newton meters. So putting all the values into the equation shown here, we can evaluate the number of friction pairs required, and that's 2.91 in this particular case. However, in practice, we can't use 2.91 pairs of friction surfaces. We need to round that up to three pairs of friction surfaces. And the final part of the question just wants us to find the actual force. So 1,000 newtons, we need 2.91 friction pairs, but of course, we're going to use three. So we need slightly less actual force. So we can calculate what that is, is going to be by just factoring down the 1,000 by the ratio of the friction pairs. So the actual axial force, so W um, dash, if you like. So it's 1,000 is what we initially applied. That related to 2.91 pairs of friction surfaces, but we're going to use three. So we can just factor down what that force would be. And I get a value of 970 newtons. So we actually um, need 30 newtons less is what it's saying. Really. Okay, so that's the actual axial force. Is that okay? So that's the question 1p. Question 2p. A multiple clutch plate has four pairs of frictional surfaces, so n is four in this case. Each has an internal diameter of 0.12 meters and an external diameter of 0.2 meters. The mu, the coefficient of friction, is 0.3. And a uniform pressure condition is assumed. So uniform pressure here, that's for basically a new clutch. We've got to determine the spring force required, that's a symbol W when the plate transmits 20 kilowatts of power at 1400 revs per minute. Also, what would the spring force be if a constant wear assumption had been made? So there's two parts and two sort of outcomes here. One based on the uniform pressure theory, one based on the uniform wear theory. So again, as always, let's just get the information from the question first of all before we think about the analysis as such. Okay, that's information there. We've got to assume constant uh, pressure in this case, so we need the constant pressure formula. So what we're doing again, if we constant pressure formula we'll be using is this one shown here at the top of the page for the torque. I'll work out the uh, torque again. I've given the power in the question. I'm given the speed in the question, so I can work out the torque. So I think I'll do that first of all. Work out the torque from my um, power equation. So let's call that find torque. So from power is equal to torque multiplied by the angular velocity. We can transpose that. We want the torque. So torque is equal to power divided by the angular velocity. And of course, that must be in radians per second, which we've, we've got here. So 20 times 10 to the 3 is our watts. And 146.6 is the value I'm using here. So according to my calculator, you check this if you would, I get 136.4 newton meters for my torque. If you could check that. Okay, so my torque then. So now, make sure we pick up the, the appropriate formula. We're talking um, initially anyway about constant pressure assumption. So more complicated formula here. So I'm going to find the um, use a torque formula. And we're going to rearrange the torque formula to find the actual force. So again, a little bit of transposition uh, required. So we're going to find now axial force. 
that symbol W in our equations, that's the force that's pushing the two uh, the various clutch plates together. So again, from, I'm going to put down my equation I'm using. So here's my formula for the torque, for the constant pressure consideration. And we're trying to find the actual force W here. So here's my transposition for the actual force W. It equals to 3 multiplied by the torque, T multiplied by in brackets, the R0 squared minus the RI squared. And that's all divided by 2 multiplied by the coefficient of friction mu, multiplied by in brackets, the R0 cubed minus the RI cubed. And that's multiplied by the N on the bottom line there. That should evaluate to 1,392 newtons. I'll let you check that value for yourself. Okay, so that's the actual force, assuming the um, constant um, pressure theory. They want us also to do the same for the constant wear. What would the actual force be if the clutch was under the constant wear assumption? So let's have a go again. Same kind of thing. We just got to pick up the the next equation. So find actual force using constant wear equation. Okay, so we need to get the appropriate torque equation. We're going to transpose it again for W. So, do you want to have a go see if we transpose that for W? So we're picking up the values again from the question. Fourteen hundred and twenty point eight newtons is my value there. So it would need increased force because of course we got the constant wear assumption there, so it's a greater force required. Okay. Let's go through a uh, question three piece. So, uh, a clutch plate has four pairs of contact surfaces. N is equal to four. We've got the external diameter given and the internal diameter given. First of all, assuming uniform pressure, constant pressure, we've got to find the total spring force W pressing the plates together. And again, we've got the power given. Got to transmit 25 kilowatts at again a res per minute angular velocity. Just be careful in some questions they do give the speed in terms of the res per second. Just be careful. Um, I have seen that crop in a few questions, but these are all in res per minute, so um, that's consistent. And then take the coefficient of friction as a value of 0.3. There is a second part here, which we will do in stages. Um, We'll just read it through for the moment. It says if there are six springs, each of a stiffness 13 kilonewtons per meter, and each in contact with the surfaces, which is worn away by 1.25 millimeters, what's the maximum power that can be transmitted for the same speed, assuming a uniform wear uh, and the same coefficient of friction? So it sounds a bit different approach to that last part of the question which we'll look at a bit later on because we've got to account for actually account for the wear the friction surface of a worn away by a specific value and knowing the spring stiffness you'll see we'll be able to work out what the relaxation in force is and so what the, what the reduction is in terms of the torque and the power we can transmit so that's down the line a little bit but that's that's something we've got to consider that's a new element to the question let's go to a First part of the question, though, first of all, get the information out of that question again, nice and clearly labelled. OK, that's the information dragged out of the question there. We've got to find the spring force uh, applied, uh, pushing the uh, plates together here. Find the force W in this case. So how am I going to do that? Well, I've got the torque given to me in the question. So we're talking constant pressure here. In the question, they, they implicitly give me the torque because I can find it from the power and the speed. So I've got a number of plates, so I can actually kind of rearrange that equation to find, to find W in that case. So this looks quite straightforward, really. We're going to, first of all, find the torque we need. So 151.6 newton meters I find for my uh, torque there. 
So now we're going to um, rearrange the equation for the constant pressure to find the actual force applied. So I've got step two. So find actual force. So from, can let you do the transposition on that, see if you can transpose it to make W the subject. So anyway, eventually I find I've got 1353.4 and that will of course be Newton's because it's a force there. So do you want to just check see if you get something like that? Okay, so that's the first part of the question done. This is sort of similar to what we've done previously. Let's look at the second part of the question. So, so diagrammatically, that, that's the situation we've got. We're told in the question that we have these four pairs of friction surfaces. So don't forget, four pairs of friction surfaces means we have eight contact surfaces. So um, if I sort of highlight them. So, so we have sort of a contact surface here. So it's one, there's two three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So, all right, so that's the contact surfaces. And we're told that each of those surfaces wears by 1.25 millimeters. Now, what we've got here in this particular arrangement, um, it says it's got six springs that are providing the actual force. So with the wear that's occurring here, those springs will relax. Uh, and they will actually slightly use some of their force. So what the second part of the question, uh, where it says if there are six springs, each of stiffness 13 kilonewtons per meter, and each of the contact surfaces are worn by 1.25 millimeters, we've got to find the maximum power that can be transmitted at the same speed, assuming uniform wear and the same coefficient of friction. And what they're trying to get us to do here is to calculate what the actual actual force will be when the springs relax because they will lose some of their uh, compression. So we've got the eight surfaces considered that are worn, and then that affects six springs, because six springs relax here. So slightly more complicated sort of uh, thought process here, something I haven't had before, um, but that's a configuration. So this is for part B of our, of our question here. Okay, so what we need to do is to work out the total loss of force here. Now, they're given the spring stiffness in the question. Now, spring stiffness is a, a formula that um, is in your formula sheets. Um, you'll find it, um, and I think it was on, on last week's um, video we mentioned it. Uh, so spring stiffness, um, K, it's often given a symbol K. So it's the characteristic of a spring. If you look up springs on the internet or you're in a, in a reference book, You'll see it talks about it's a characteristic of the spring as well as the geometry, the size, the diameter, and length of them. You'll see a symbol. Often it's k. Sometimes it is actually lambda, and it's the force divided by the extension of the spring. So you apply, say, a thousand newtons to the spring, uh, and, and it deflects ten millimeters. You can work out what the stiffness is going to be for the spring. It's force divided by deflection, and that symbol there is a delta symbol. Um, as if a deflection, it will be there. So what we can do here is work out the total movement uh, that we've got here for all the uh, plates. And from that, we'll be able to find how much this spring relaxes. And from that, we'll be able to find how much force is lost uh, knowing the stiffness of the spring. So basically, we're going to rearrange this equation to find the uh, lost axial force. So... Um, if I change that symbol, that's a conventional symbol to use F there, but if I make it W in our case, because we're talking about W for axial force, just to make the symbol um, more relevant to our problem, I can actually find what the uh, loss of force is going to be. So I'll put that over here. So loss, loss of axial force here. Um, so I'll call that, um, I can call it W loss if you want to, for this word. And what I'm doing is just rearranging this equation above. So I'm going to get K multiplied by the delta. K is the spring stiffness. That's given in the question. Just highlighted it here. And that's a characteristic of the spring. It's given in newtons per meter. That's fine. They are sometimes given in newtons per millimeter. So you've got to be careful. That's newtons per meter. And this um, delta, 
distance here. That's how much we're going to lose in terms of deflection across the entire clutch plate. Don't forget we've got eight plates here and they all are going to um, um, wear by 1.25 millimeters. So I'll try and think this through nice and carefully here. So where in this case our delta, that movement, is going to equal to, I'm going to go use meters here, 0. 00125 that's taken the 1.25 millimeters and put it into meters and don't forget there are eight surfaces here all right so we multiply that by eight and that will be the total distance we lose yet yeah, we're assuming that every um, friction surface there is wearing by the amount given in the question which is 1.25 millimeters or 0 0.00125 meters so our actual um, movement here, doing the calculation on that, I get a value of 0 0.01 meters. So that's the loss. Now from that, we can work out, that's just loss of, of geometry, if you like. From that, we can work out the loss of the actual um, actual force for a spring. So back to our little formula here, W loss is going to be the spring stiffness which is the 13,000 newtons per meter and that's now multiplied by the 0 0.01 so our loss there will be 130 and that's now newtons because we multiply the newtons per meter stiffness by the distance of 0 0.01 so um, 130 newtons but that's per spring because we've done our calculation that's per spring okay and we've got in this case it said six springs so we're going to multiply that by by six so the total loss is simply going to be the 130 multiplied by the six so it's 780 we do 780 newtons by the wear of the each of the surfaces that's our total loss um, of the actual force actual force in this case so now we can find the net force that's applied to the um, clutch plate go on that part one part b and part two let's find the revised axial load applied now so wr is simply going to be our original value which was um, 1354 that's what we calculated we needed we've now lost 780 of that due to physical wear of the surfaces so now we've got 574 newtons applied to our uh, clutch plate so quite a drop there quite quite a wet bit of wear there of course hope you're okay with that so I tried to labour that a little bit, that, that just to try and sort of show you how that consideration of the wear is accounted for. We need the little formula for spring stiffness, k equals w upon delta. We transpose the equation, um, worked out what the total um, loss of distance is for each of the plates, and we can find the loss of the force for one spring, and then factor that by the number of springs we've got. So taking the 780 from the 1354, we get 574. Now we know what the actual force is. Uh, now we can actually work out the torque that can be applied in this particular situation. So we're sort of building back up uh, to eventually finding the power. If we find the torque that can be applied based on the WR there, we can then find the power that's transmitted uh, due to the wear. So third step here. Perhaps I can let you do this. You've simply got to work out the torque that can now be generated um, in this case. Don't forget we're assuming the uniform wear theory here. So find, and we're going to assume wear theory. So perhaps I can let you have a play with that. Pick up the appropriate equation related to transmitting the torque in uniform wear. Now we've got the new WR here, that's the revised axial load. You can work out what the torque is going to be. So can I let you have a little play with that for a moment? And see if you can work out the, the revised torque and then the power after that. 
So this class I'm putting the numbers into the equation this time, no transposition. I'll let you put the numbers in the equation. I get 62 newtons if you want to check that. 62 newton meters if you want to check that value. And then we've got to find the power, so the last thing to do find the power. So it says it wants the same speed, so we'll use our same velocity as before. So that's the 164.93 we've got here. So about 10.2 kilowatts I work it out a bit. Go to check. Okay, so quite a quite a lengthy question, question 3P. Okay, I want to take you through question four, because again, that brings in a little bit of prerequisite work. Um, just a few formulae here that we haven't used before. But the overall essence of the question is actually very similar to what we've done before. Just we've got to pick up some sort of um, some information ourselves here. Okay, question 4P. Consider two shafts, A and B, shown in the diagram down here, connected by a diaphragm spring plate clutch. Um, on engaging the clutch, it takes five seconds for B to obtain a speed of 200 RPM from rest. Now that's kind of kinematic information, what's sometimes called kinematic information, relates to the uh, actual motion of the uh, clutch without knowing the forces, because it's called kinematic. So we've got a time and we've got some speed, uh, initial velocity and a final uh, velocity. We're given the outside and inside diameters again of the friction surfaces, millimetres, 200 millimetres and 120 millimetres respectively. We're given this, this term here, the shaft moment of inertia. I'm not sure if you've come across that before. I'll we'll mention that in a moment. Of 20 kilogram metres squared. It goes back to Newton's second law for angular motion. Uh, I'm also given a friction coefficient of 0.3. It says both sides of the clutch plate are used here, so we'll have two pairs of friction surfaces. We've got to find the required spring force, so that's W again, based both on the uniform pressure and then the uniform wear series. And it's given a little hint in the question, um, a formula we might want to use. This T is equal to I alpha, I mentioned that earlier. That's basically Newton's second law applied to angular motion, that's F equals MA in the linear context t is equal to alpha in the angular context and this alpha symbol here is angular acceleration um, and it's the final angular velocity minus the initial angular velocity divided by the time taken so you can see in the, in the question they've actually given us the implicitly they've given us the alpha because we know the final angular velocity that's 200 rpm we need to convert that to radians per second but we know what that is we know the initial angle of velocity because they say it starts from rest and so that will be zero in this case and the acceleration occurred over a period of um, five seconds so so we can find the alpha um, once we've got the alpha we're going to need to find the you know, we've got given the i actually in the question it's given to us we can find the torque so there's another way of giving us the torque here in the previous questions they gave us a torque implicitly so the power is equal to torque times angle of velocity formula here they're giving us the torque implicitly through the t is equal to i alpha equation which is newton's second law so a slight twist on the information given but the rest of the question will be very very similar to what we've done before okay so just to show you a velocity time diagram, again, this is something we did in sort of level three work a long time ago. And this is a velocity time diagram. On the horizontal axis, we've got time. And on the vertical axis, we've got angular velocity, which of course must be in terms of radians per second. Okay. And then the slope of the line, that relates to what's called the acceleration. So that gradient of the line there is the acceleration. And we calculate that using the equation here. Okay, that's, just, that's basically the, equation, the slope of that line. So we're able to find the acceleration quite easily, and I said we've got the inertia uh, given in the question. When we're inertia, we're given, um, and so we'll be able to find the torque. And the way we go then, once we've got the torque. Okay, so let's um, extract the information from the question as usual. What else have we got? We've got this moment of inertia. Let's get that um, written down. The moment of inertia. Uh, so the moment of inertia, and the inertia is the resistance to motion. 
So the bigger the inertia, the bigger the resistance to, to the motion. So inertia, simple I, most textbooks. And that's given as 20 kilogram meters squared. So that's the correct units. The coefficient of friction is given. Put that there, maybe mu. 0.3 again. And we have n is equal to 2 in this case. So two pairs of uh, friction surfaces. So they're, they're contacting there and they're contacting there is what it's trying to tell us there. So n is equal to 2. Okay, so we've got to calculate the spring force required. So that'll be W we're trying to look for in the question. So first of all, I need to know the torque. Let's get the torque sorted out first of all. Find the angle acceleration. That's simple alpha. Okay, so we're given the equation in the question that the alpha, the angle acceleration, is equal to the omega f, that's the final angular velocity, minus the omega i, the initial angular velocity, that's all divided by the time taken. So in this particular case, this you could call it omega f if you want to. That's our omega f. In this particular case, omega i is zero, it starts from rest. And we've got t is equal to five seconds. We've got all that information over here, t is equal to five seconds. Let's stick the numbers into the equation. So 4.189 radians per second squared acceleration. Right, that's angular acceleration, rotational acceleration. Just check that to make sure you're okay with that one. So now I'm going to use the equation t is equal to i alpha to find the torque. So again, they gave me this in the question. This time I'm using. Uh, this equation, just highlight it. Um, I can use this one, give you the question. T is equal to I alpha. So step two, find the torque applied, T. So in the previous question, I said that we have to find the torque using the power equation, P is equal to T omega. That's the way they implicitly gave us a torque. Here they're giving it through the inertia of the, the clutch here. So from and it's a very standard equation by the way in mechanics t is equal to i alpha we can find the torque because we know the um, i is given in the question and we just worked out the alpha so in this case the i is 20 kilogram meters squared multiply that by our alpha value 83.8 and that, of course, would be Newton meters now. We're into torque, so Newton meters. And that's kind of broken the back of the problem, really, as far as uh, the sort of new thought process is concerned, because um, we now just need to pick up the appropriate equation for our, from our clutch plate theory um, and then rearrange that to find W. So maybe I could let you take it from here. The next stage uh, in our process, we're going to find the axial force required W, and we're going to assume, let's go back to what the question says, constant pressure theory, so assume. So could I let you take it from there? You need to now choose the appropriate equation and then rearrange it for W. So go back to your little formula sheet, whatever, look for constant pressure, find the appropriate torque equation, and then uh, transpose it to find W. Question then also wants the constant wear as well, does it? Oh yeah, it wants both of them. So constant pressure to begin with, uniform pressure to begin with, and then it wants the uniform wear as well. So can I let you have a play with those so you see what you get? And here are my solutions for the actual force, W for the constant pressure theory. Here's my torque equation for the constant pressure theory. And rearranging the equation, W is 1710 newtons. And then for the constant wear theory, here's my torque equation for the constant wear theory. And again, rearranging for W, I get a value of 1746 newtons. Here's the full solution for question 4P. Here's the alpha value initially calculated for the angle acceleration. Here's the torque required to produce the required angle acceleration. Then assuming constant pressure, here's the actual force W. 1,710 newtons, and then considering uniform wear theory, the actual force W is 1,746 newtons required.
I will leave you with question 5P for enrichment. Here a plate clutch consists of a flat driven plate that is gripped between a driving plate and a presser plate, shown in the sketch below. So there are two pairs of friction surfaces here. They each have an inner diameter of 200 millimeters and an outer diameter of 350 millimeters. The friction coefficient is given as 0.4 and we're given a working pressure which is 1.7 bar. Notice the conversion here from bar to pascals. So part A, assuming the pressure is uniform, we've got to calculate the power that can be transmitted at 1000 RPM. In part B, if the clutch becomes worn so that the intensity of pressure is inversely proportional to the radius, in other words, that means it's constant wear, and the total axial force on the pressure plate remains unaltered, we've got to calculate the power that now can be transmitted at the 1000 RPM speed, and also the greatest intensity of pressure on the friction surfaces. And part C, we've got to repeat part two above for worn clutch theory, but this time assuming the maximum pressure remains at 1.7 bar. I'll leave that question with you to attempt for enrichment. Answers are shown in the bracket for your reference. And finally, just going to briefly outline cone clutch theory. Essentially, the formulae we derive for cone clutches is very very similar to that derived for flat plate clutches and the analysis is very similar with the assumptions and being the same. If we refer to our previous presentation when we calculated the actual force for a flat plate clutch we found the integral for W equation 1 in our previous presentation 1c here is exactly the same integral. However when we consider the torque transmitted there's a slight variation in the formula it's almost exactly the same as for flat plate clutches, but this time we have a cosec beta term outside the integral for equation 2c. It's the only difference between the equations for cone clutches and flat clutches. And that cosec beta term, which of course is 1 upon sine beta, considering the definition, is because the clutch surface this time is inclined at angle beta. So in the derivation we have to account for this, and that becomes the sine beta term shown here which becomes cosec beta if we write it on the top line in the integral. So if we now compare the flat plate clutches to the conical clutches, the only difference we find is that in the formula for torque for constant pressure, we have a cosec beta term, and for the constant wear theory, we have a cosec beta term. Mm -hmm. Notice there is no n term here, because the number of friction pairs in this case is considered to be one. So there's only one pair of friction surfaces assumed for a cone clutch. Question 1c outlines the solution related to a cone clutch. So a friction clutch of conical form rotates at 240 rpm. The coefficient of friction is given as 0.26 for the materials in contact. The axial thrust W is 0.4 kN and the maximum diameter of the engaged materials is 240 mm and the minimum diameter is 160 mm. If the included angle of the cone, note that's 2 beta, is 25 degrees, we've, we've got to calculate the power that can be transmitted. Firstly, part A, when the clutch is new, so that's constant pressure theory. Secondly, part B, when the clutch is worn, constant wear theory. I will let you review the following solution at your own pace. Just notice that the beta value we use in the following formula is half of the included angle given in the question, so we use 12.5 degrees. Question 1c continued, so part A, we have to consider the power transmitted by an unworn clutch, that's a new clutch if you like, constant pressure theory. The only difference in the formula between this and that for flat plate clutches is this cosec beta term. And again, remember that cosec beta is 1 upon sine beta on your calculator. That produced a torque of 48.7 newton meters. And we're asked to find the power transmitted power of P is 1.22 kilowatts. Question 1c continued is part B. Now we have to consider the power transmitted in a worn clutch, an old clutch, that's constant wear theory. 
And again, the only difference in the formula for torque between the flat plate clutch and the cone clutch is this coset beta term here applied in the formula. Evaluating, we find the torque is 48 newton meters based on the assumptions made here. And again, working at the power, we find that's 1.2 kilowatts. I will leave you with questions 3C to attempt at your own pace. Answers are given in the bracket here.